Incredible words. Okay. So Extremist. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Oh wow. Militant. Oh, okay. 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 Violent. Let's go. Okay. Okay. Severe. Okay. Excessive. Okay. Riotous. Okay. And revolutionary. Ooh. Okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. Cool. Does that describe your Christianity today? Oh. Wow. 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 Does that describe the Christianity? You believe in. Wow. You know, I want to. I want to let you know today that guys, we, we cannot. We can't make a change in this world through conformity. No. Amen. Yes. You cannot make a change in this world through normality. Come on. We cannot make a change in this world by picking popularity. Yes. Ooh. We cannot make a change in this world by being sensitive with, with sentimentality. Come on. You Talk have to stand, it. guys. You gotta go against the grain. Talk you have a sense it. of strong convictions. You gotta hold on to the calling, guys. That's how we change the world. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Come on, bro. Come on, bro. You know, there was a preacher and an Uber driver. Oh, okay. oh tell us. And, uh, you know, of course, the Uber driver was going to church. And, uh, unfortunately, they died. <laughs> and, you know, and when, they, when they, both, they both died and they went to heaven, and, of course, you know, Peter's there in the pearly gates, and he's waiting for them. And he says, come with me, says Peter, uh, to the taxi driver. So, of course, the Uber driver, you know, did as he told, and he, he followed Peter around, and, and, you know, Peter showed him to a mansion. And, you know, he's like, you know what? And he just mentioned it had everything he could, you know, put his mind to, right? I'm talking about a jacuzzi, wow. so I'm talking about a huge pool, I'm talking about a bowling alley, I'm talking about everything this guy could imagine for. That's what he found, right? That's what he got. Next, Peter calls the preacher, and he leads him to an old rugged shack with a bunk bed and a little old television set. Brother's awesome. Hey. <laughs> the preacher's like, wait, I, I think you got a few things mixed up here, Peter. Say the priest. Shouldn't I be the one who gets the mention? After all, I was a preacher. Wow. I went to church every day. I preached God's word. I, I understand that there must be a confusion. Yeah. Peter said, yes, that's true. Oh. But during the sermons, people slept. Oh. When the Uber driver drove, everyone prayed. Oh. 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 I hope today no one sleeps in the last name. Amen. Amen. Oh, oh, I guess it was in heaven right there. Yeah. 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 The title of the lesson is Radical Christianity. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Radical Christianity. Yes. Before we begin, I want to share about a few individuals who, in a sense, changed the world and to some extent kind of did change the world. You ask who are these individuals? The first one is Emmeline uh, Pankhurst, right? Uh, this is a British woman of the Digital Union. Someone know in the church. Uh, she was a British woman, of course, in about 1903. She founded what is known as the Women's Franchise League, okay? And you know what I love, of course, is that she had, she had a, a band of women with her as well, and so wow. forth. And she was a radical woman. You ask how radical was she? She went through hunger strikes because she said, hey, I want women to have the right to vote in England. Amen. Amen. And guess what happened? She got arrested. <laughs> well, she got arrested for her strong convictions. She came out of prison, of course, and she played a major role in, you know, for the effects of the, of the World War One, right there. Wow. That's Emily Pankhurst, the British woman of God. Wow. It says that Martin Luther King. You know, we know Martin Luther King. Yeah. 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 And of course, he was famous for his "I Have a Dream" speech, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, he was the leader of the civil rights movement. And you know, he wanted to end, he wanted equal rights for both black, uh, black individuals and white individuals as well. Amen. Amen. And of course, sadly, he was assassinated in April 4, 1968. Another mm. individual is Nelson Mandela. Come, Come on. on! You know, he is, of course, revered in South Africa for his resistance against the apartheid state, of course, of South Africa at that time. 
And you know, Mandela originally he was and he, he tried to flee, he not flee, but he tried to like because of course he was a you know the resistance guy against uh, 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 the oppression in South Africa, mm -hmm. and he tried to flee South Africa. Well, what happened is he got arrested. Wow. Okay, and uh, you know he got arrested, and when he was arrested, he was arrested for like, 27 years. Wow. And of course, before his arrest, he had strikes, he had strikes, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, he, he was trying to go against the government of, of just the segregation that was going on in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Other 20, 27 years, he was, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, um, judged to go to, to die, and of course, in jail, right? So he was prison in jail for life. But he comes out 27 years later, in 1994, he gets to be, you know, the president of South Africa, he ends the black and white segregation, and of course, that's when, you know, South Africa was liberated. Amen? Amen. 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 There's a few individuals that are known out there who have changed the way we live today. But you know, I want to talk to you about an individual who lived about 2,000 years ago. His name is Jesus. Come on, man. Come on, man. Us, Jesus is the man who's changed the entire world in such a way, I love how Elizabeth shared that he is the great liberator. Oh, yeah. He is the great redeemer. Jesus changed the whole entire world and we have no idea how he changed the world. He took a bunch of 12 men and in a sense today Christians by far one of the biggest religions out there. Yeah. Jesus changed the world. Mm. A book author by the name Jeremiah Johnston. He has a book entitled Unimaginable. Mm. He describes Christianity, he describes a world rather without Christianity. Yeah. He says, you know, you ask yourself, okay, how has Christianity shaped society today? How has it changed the world today? There was a time period where the Greeks and the Romans would practice something called infanticide. Mm -hmm. Okay? What would happen is they, 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 they would kill babies, uh, babies that are born with deformities, or babies that are in a sense well, females, or babies that they don't want. Mm -hmm. So it was a common practice in Greeks and Roman culture. Woo! So they'll throw babies away, and what would happen is the Christians who are brave enough to walk the streets late at night, they'll take the babies, raise them up, and make them their own. Wow. Come on! That's what Christianity has done Come on. over the years. I hope you guys are with me today. Yeah, yeah, bro. Bro. Matthew 10, let's go to the Bible. Come on. Well, there. Radical Christianity. Wow. Matthew 10 verse 1 it says this. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Elpheus and Pelias, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. You know, we hear. Jesus says he called his 12 disciples and gave authority and he called them apostles. And of course, uh, the word authority over here comes from the Greek word uh, exousia, okay? So it means to be delegated authority right there. So the authority he had, he gave it to the, uh, to the apostles as well. Come on. But before they were called apostles, they were disciples first. Come mm. on, mm. sorry. They were disciples first. Yeah. Before you want to get any other title in the kingdom of God, you got to be a disciple first. Amen. Yes. Yes. You got to be a disciple first. Yes. Wow. Good point. And of course, what happens over here is that we, we, we see this list over here. <laughs> this list is so full of diversity. Mm. The guys of Jesus Christ. Come on. Love it. Love it. You ask yourself, okay, well, what, what kind of diversity does he have? But first of all, he says over here, the apostles, right? Now, apostle has two meanings in the Bible. The first being, in the strict uh, official sense, apostle is you have to be someone who's uh, selected by Jesus, trained by Jesus personally, one to one, okay? Uh, and then you, you must have seen Jesus resurrected physically from the dead. Okay, it means messenger. Mm. The loose meaning of the word apostle, it means someone who just is a messenger. That's yeah. it, right? So today, I can be an apostle because I'm a messenger to you today. Amen. Right. So all these preachers who are out there calling themselves apostles, you got to ask them, hey, have you seen Jesus Christ resurrected? Exactly. If not, you're not an apostle, amen? Right, wow. bro. Come on. Come on. Freak, bro. Freak. But what I love is that, you know, of course, you, you got the 12 apostles over here, and then later on, we have a guy called Paul. <laughs> okay, Paul is an apostle. Why is he an apostle? You know, of course, he wasn't converted in the, in the ministry of Jesus, but when you read the Bible, Acts chapter 1, on the road to Damascus, he sees Jesus Christ resurrected physically. Jesus Christ calls him, according to Galatians chapter 1, he trained him personally for three years, and after three years, he went to the brothers right there. Yeah. So that's why he can call himself an apostle. That's why he says, I am one who's abnormally born. Yeah. Come on. And what I love is that during this time, there was persecution in the church. 
And three years later, a guy named Paul gets baptized. Paul gets baptized, changes the whole entire church, changes the whole entire movement, and this is why it's important for us to baptize guys. One baptism can change the whole entire church. Man! One baptism can change the whole church. The whole church. That's why I'm so glad that this Wednesday, this boss Wednesday, Robert. Hey. Oh, yeah. Hey. 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 That is a game changer. You yes. know, that is a game changer. Yes. Melvin, of course, some of you guys understand. Melvin is a, a young, you know, he's a teen, 19 years of age, and he was reached out to by Ebenezer right there. Come on, and, uh, and, and of course, Melvin, he's from uh, like I mentioned, he's going to be studying, uh, you know, business very soon, you know, in the university. Hey. And uh, but before that, you know, he won uh, a scholarship uh, out of you know about two, over 200 applicants, right? Wow. He won a scholarship to be able to speak uh, on behalf of the UN. On issues behind knife crime, you know, uh, you know, black and white segregation, so forth, all these different issues that are out there, and, and that's that's who God has chosen to get baptized yeah. into the church. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Come on, man. Now we look, we look at these guys, the, the apostles. Okay, we got we got to study out their occupation over here. Oh. Okay, we got we got to look deep into them. Yes. So the first guys we have over here in verse two, it says Simon was called Peter, his brother Andrew. James and Zebedee and his brother John. So we know, of course, who these guys are. They were fishermen. Okay, that's the, that's what their uh, occupation. On, it says Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the text collector. Right. So we started out Matthew last week. You know, we figured, of course, he's a text collector. He was a guy who loved money, but then in a sense, when Jesus Christ came to him, he was willing to give all all that up and follow Christ. Yeah. And then you have it says uh, James and Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot. <laughs> Okay. okay, now you, saw, you guys, I don't know, I don't think you guys understand who the zealots were. Right? Okay, so to, to help you understand them here, right, we kind of have our own modern day zealot over here. Come on, Brian. Hey. Come on. Come on, Now, hey. who are the zealots? Let me tell you who the zealots were. They were heavily, they were heavily engaged in politics and anarchy, basically. Okay? So they were all about attempting to overthrow the Roman government. Literally, that's all they were, okay? And when it comes to Simon, okay, he, he, he is a guy who was all about politics at that time. <laughs> okay, he was all about politics. Like, hey, we, we want to be free from the oppression of Rome. Yeah. That's what he was. And in, in, you know, in Matthew 27, you have a guy called Jesus Barabbas, all right? You guys know about him? Yeah. yeah. The guy who was supposed to be executed, instead, Jesus Christ was set free instead, right? He was a zealot, wow. right? When you study out Luke and John, it says he was, he was involved in an uprising and murder, okay? So that describes the kind of guy that Thomas Simon was over here, guys. Yeah. He was a zealot, he was a crazy guy. But I love what Jesus, he grabs this guy who's all about politics. And says, hey, you're zealous for, you know, uh, for Rome in a sense and so forth and for the Jews, but now you're going to be zealous for me, Amen. all right? Because Jesus is not about politics, he's apolitical, guys, yeah. okay? He's not all about this politician, mm -hmm. that politician. He's like, no, no, we only have one kingdom, the kingdom of God. Jeez, bring your bread. Amen. Come on. And then you've got this guy called Judas Iscariot. Oh, okay. Now, who is Judas Iscariot? You know, his surname comes from the Latin, Sicarius. Which means assassin or murderer. Oh it is suggested that he would have belonged to the family of the Sakurai. Okay, this is known as the most radical Jewish groups, and some of them who were known as to be terrorists. Woo! So Jesus grabs this, this this guy who's a terrorist for the Jews, and he's like, "You come along and be part of my group." <laughs> that gives an idea of who Judas Iscariot was. And sadly, you know, there are many false things about Judas out there. According to Islamic uh, polemic literature, Judas seems to become a traitor, but instead he lied to the Jews in order to defend Jesus. Right. And this is why, according to the Quran, Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross. Right. In the 14th century, a cosmographer by the name of Al Dimashki he maintains that Judas assumed Jesus' likeness and he was crucified instead in the place of Judas. What? Of Jesus, rather. Oh, wow. Jesus. In the second century, Right, the Apocrypha at that time, second century Apocrypha, there's something called the Gospel of Judas. Yeah. And of course, you know, this is a Gnostic text written in Greek, okay? They say that Judas was, in a sense, a collaborator and a confidant of Jesus. So, what does that mean? This is saying that Judas, in a sense, knew the ins and outs of the kingdom of God, he knew the ins and outs of God's plan. So, him betraying Jesus was part of God's plan in hope that Judas would, in a sense, liberate himself. That's what the Apocrypha teaches on the Gospel of Judas. 
But we're gonna see what the Bible says about Judas. Amen. Luke twenty two. Point number one: Where do you belong? Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. Mm, message for real, man. Where do you belong? Luke twenty two. The title is Radical Christianity. Preach, bro. First point is where do you belong? Look 22, you guys there? Yeah. Where do you belong? We're Bible Church, guys. Yes. Yeah. We're Bible Church. Where do you belong? Look 22, verse 31. Says we here. Simon! Simon! You know, whenever Jesus calls the name twice, man, you know you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, it's almost like you know your mom. When your mom calls by your first name right there, you know, it's like, man, you're in trouble. Amen. Okay, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I pray for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail and when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. Mm. Wow, great much. You know, the word sift over here, okay, it means to test. Sifting is bigger shaking that's required for you to instead separate the, the weak kernels from the debris. Okay? That's what it is. It's just, it's just separate, it's bigger shaking to separate. Okay, this is the weed and this is all the dirt and so forth out there. And the Bible says over here the enemy wants to shake Peter's faith mm. to a point where Peter will fall away. Right. That's what it, and what's in is that Satan asked permission mm. from Jesus. Wow. He went to Jesus and said, Hey, Satan. Uh, hey, hey, sorry, say to me to Jesus, say, hey, can I, can I test Peter over here? I, I don't think he's really sold out. And in so many ways, Jesus, you know, Satan goes to, he goes to Jesus, and he asks to save some of you today. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. He asks to test some of your faith today. It's like, no, nah, that brother really isn't sold out. Ask him to give all his money for special missions and watch him, he's going to leave. Jeez. Uh, what, what, what? Watch him, he's going to leave. Mm. The brother isn't really sold out. Mm. Ask him to go back to his country and preach the word of God. Oh. And he's going to leave. Mm. That brother isn't sold out. Make him unfruitful for another year and he's going to leave. Wow. Mm. That sister really isn't sold out. Okay. Let her wait one more year for her husband and she'll leave. Oh. That sister really isn't sold out. Spicy. Give her a record deal and she will leave you. Oh, no. Mm. no, no, no. Mm. That sister really isn't sold out. <clears throat> I'm gonna bring back her ex into her life and watch her leave you, God. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's what Satan's doing right now, guys. Okay, right. That's, that's a shame. Shaking people up. That's right. I, 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 I hope you guys have seen the scriptures over here. Oh, wow. Goodness. <laughs> Satan, this is the same in Job chapter 1. <laughs> he goes to God and says, hey, can I test Job? Yeah. <laughs> Satan's always asking permission to test your faith. God. Yes. Come on. And what it is is that it's not that he only tests you with your, your weaknesses, because your weakness is different. Mm -hmm. You fall into sin with your weaknesses, you're like, ah, oh, I'm weak anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. But he tests you with your strength. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Peter's friend was, hey, I'm better than everyone. Nothing will ever happen to me. I'll never fall away. Mm -hmm. like, oh, watch you test with your strength. Oh, oh, yeah. Because when, when, when Satan tests you with your strength, and you fall, and you mess up, you become disappointed, and you said you become discouraged, and you're like, man, I can't do it all. Right. That's why he tests you with the strength as well. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> Satan is sifting you guys. Oh, <laughs> Satan is sifting you. Acts chapter 1. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. <laughs> Come on, Frank. Acts chapter 1. Radical Christianity. <laughs> Where do you belong? Acts chapter 1 verse 13, again, remember, the, God, the, the, the book of Acts was written by Luke the doctor, okay? In verse 13 it says, In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had been fulfilled, in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. Then he fell headlong. His body burst open. All his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. They called that field in their language, Apadema, that is full of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms. May his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of oh, leadership. You know, these Psalms are respectively taken from 
Psalm 69, verse 25, and Psalm 109, verse 8. Yeah. You know, a lot of people always ask, Frank, what are you afraid of? You know, what's the biggest fear? And, uh, you know, contrary to, a uh, country rather, but yeah, in line with stereotypes, yes, I'm a black man who can't swim. So yes, I'm afraid of drowning. <laughs> oh, me too. So that, that's one of my fears, guys, oh, drowning. I can't swim. You know, I was just like, okay, Frank, what, what, what else are you afraid of? It wasn't because fear, it's the spiders. I'm like, yeah, I'm afraid of spiders, yeah. but I'm not really. Mm. Well, what else is the biggest fear, Frank? What are you really afraid of? Horror movies? I'm like, okay, horror movies kind of give me nightmares, but not really. <laughs> you know, my biggest fear is falling away from God. Mm. Right? That is my number one biggest fear. Bro. Falling away from God. Mm. Not having God in my life anymore. Mm. Come on, Frank. Even though, even though I, I, I have all the desires of my heart, but without God in there, I, I, I don't want that. Mm. That's my biggest fear as a disciple, falling away from God. Yeah, and, and I hope that's also your biggest fear as well. Yeah. yeah. Because you understand something, Judas over here, now this, this is a big deal guys, okay? These songs were a big deal. They're known as messianic songs. So Jews who were, in a sense, rigorous in their study would have seen, okay, this is referring to Jesus' ministry. They would have known it or would have seen it as well. But Judas was so out of touch that he didn't know that this was talking about him. Wow. 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 Jeez. He, he had no idea. Wow. The Bible was so specific in prophesying his fall away and what, what should happen once he falls away. That someone else should replace him. And, and Judas was so out of touch with that. He, he wasn't a man of the word of God. He wasn't a man who was digging into the Bible trying to say, wait, wait, this is me. I gotta change. If I don't change, I will fall away. And Judas was so out of touch. And really and truly, when I think about that, that's what happens when we are not in the word of God every day, guys. Yeah, I'm sorry. When we're not reading our Bible diligently every single day, we, 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 can, we can get to the point like Judas. You know, you, you die spiritually. Yep. You know, being fed by God. Yeah. You know, disciples want to ask you this morning, how, how are your times with God been lately? Mm -hmm. How have your times been with God lately? Are you giving your heart to God? Mm. Is God speaking to you? Mm. Are you having daily quiet time, daily prayers? Are you guys reading the Bible? Mm. Is God speaking to you? Are you guys trying to dig, dig and try to find out what, what God's trying to say to you? Mm. Yeah. You know, it's so essential, guys, to have quiet times. Mm. Come on. Yeah. yeah. So essential for us to have quiet times. Really? Right. We don't be like Judas, guys, we be clueless about the Bible. Yeah. You know, in verse 21, it says this. It says, Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For well, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So then they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. When they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. You know, earlier on we read about and Judas' body bursting open, and you know, they also get how in the world did, how, how did this happen? Okay, now remember, Luke the doctor is the one who wrote this. Okay, so the fact that he adds this in there, he's like, okay, he, he adds this graphic image because he's a doctor, so he understands these few things. So, one of the possibilities of him, in a sense, you know, his body bursting open was that he, he, he was hanged, and what happened was that no one was there, no family, no friends were there to take his body um, down from the tree. So this just shows how lonely it got when Judas left the kingdom of God. Wow. Some say he tried to commit suicide, and then you know, as he's trying to hang himself, he slipped and he, he, he fell on his head. That's what they say. So those are two possibilities that happens over there. You know, and that's what happens when you leave God's kingdom. You you realize that you know all those friends you thought you had yep. are not really your friends. Preach. Yeah. Preach. It becomes lonely out there. Yeah. I've had I've had calls from far away, crying late at night, saying I I I'm just I'm drinking alcohol every day just to drown my misery. Mm. Mm. But too shameful to come back to the kingdom. Mm. You know, there was a time, you know, as a disciple, 
I remember in 2016, and you know, I was in my final year of university at this time. And I had no money, I was struggling financially, and you know, and of course the Bible says, hey, if, if you if you need, seek first the kingdom of God, amen. Mm -hmm. So okay, I sought first the kingdom, you know, I went to the, the disciples at the time, I said, hey guys, can you help me out? Can I just stay at your place? You know, uh, I, I will pay about 50 pounds a week for, for rent, that's all I have, right? So the boss, okay, cool, we'll get back to you. And they come back to me and they say, you know what, friend, you can stay with us for three months for free. I'm like, man, that's awesome. So I, I, I moved to this brother's household. Now, of course, this brother's household flat out cranks, okay? Now, okay, we had a few uh, single, uh, single professionals and a few guys were in the full-time ministry. Now, one of them was working for TFL, okay, which is Transport for London. And, you know, when you work for TFL, they get free travel. Yeah. So when he's there, you know, he's like, okay, I, I can nominate someone else who are liberal to get free travel. So he puts me on board. He's like, hey, Frank, here's some free travel for you for the whole year in London. Oh, the so wow. Wow. Okay, okay. Wow. and then, of course, one of the guys who lives there is a chef. He works in the kitchen. Right. So every night he brings some leftovers and stuff like that. So he came home with a whole bunch of eggs and a fish. And so I'm like, man, I get my protein sorted. And I'm like, God bless me, right? And I was like, man, it's like free rent, free food, and free travel right there in London for a whole entire year. Now, of course, during this time, you know, uh, what happened was it was a household of our seven brothers, okay? Uh, I was the only campus kid at the time. And, you know, uh, two of them of the seven are still faithful today. Wow. Wow. One of them is called Richard Franco. Right? Yeah! <laughs> okay, he's, he's got some kids, he's got some yeah. kids. Uh, another one is called Jonathan Picadoni. Hey. Right? Hey. The others were very keen and essential in my conversion. Wow. The others were in the full time ministry. Jeez. And you know what took them up? Pride, sex, Jeez. Uh, and just lack of love for God. <laughs> And one of the people who lived there, what happened was, um, you know, he had a, he had a, a um, the same ex who he brought into the kingdom. And, you know, recently we found out that she was giving birth and she died in the hospital. Oh, she fell away that same year as well. Oh, and, I, and I think about, I'm like, man, if only she stayed faithful for a couple of more years. Yeah. Right? She would have died and went on to glory. But at that time, she chose. She's like, no, I don't belong in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And she went where she belonged. Mm -hmm. right. You know, that could happen to us. Right. Mm -hmm. That could happen to us, Gary. Keep it real, bro. That, that, that could happen to us, guys. Ooh, we, we, we've got to understand, guys, Satan is sifting us. Yeah. Yeah. Satan's going to test you. He, he, doesn't want you to, he doesn't want you to stay faithful. He wants you to fall away. Mm. And we've got to, we have to be so reminded about, you know, about just, just people who, who, in a sense, but when you leave God, you go where you belong. Wow. Wow. Do you know where you belong today, guys? Is the kingdom where you belong? Yes. Or do you feel like, hey, you belong in the world? Hey, I know. You know, I, I encourage you. And I, I want to let you know, guys, that we need to, in a sense, know that this is where we belong, guys. Amen. Yep. The kingdom of God is where you belong. Amen. The church is where you belong. You belong with God. Right? You, you need to make a decision today to never, ever fall away from God. Yeah. Don't ever fall away from God. Never. Nope. Don't be like Judas, guys. And the only way, of course, we can avoid this is if you're in the Word of God every day. Amen. If you're in the Word of God every day. Amen. 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 Point number two, Matthew 10, guys. Wow. Yeah, Prime. Matthew 10, guys. Okay, we're still in Matthew. Yeah, we're with you. Let's go. Point number two is radical Christianity is a radical message. Um, Come on, bro. Radical Christianity is a radical message. Matthew 10. We read in verse 4. We have a lengthy read over here, but it says in verse 4 Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. There we go. I like this. Wow. The Bible is so awesome hey, and man. crystal clear. Mm. When Jesus calls you, appoints you, he gives instructions as well. Yeah. He gives instructions as well. What kind of instructions? He said, do not go among the Gentiles or any other town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. I love this. Okay. He calls them, 
appoints them, gives instructions, and tells them to preach a specific message. Yes. Come Let's on. go. It says we here, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, drive out demons freely you have received, freely you get it. Not get any gold or silver or copper or take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worth his keep. You know, the Bible said, hey, if someone's working the full time ministry, you gotta take care of him, amen? Amen. We got you, bro. It says, whatever town or village you enter, for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give you a greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, Right, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. A radical Christianity has a radical message. It says right here, Jesus called these guys and he commissions them, of course. He gives them something called the Limited Commission, which is only to the Jews. Later on, he gives them authority to, in a sense, for the Great Commission, which is all nations, all right? But over here, the word instruct, okay, the word, um, yeah, instruct, it, it comes from the military, okay? So Jesus in a sense, like, hey, I'm giving you this command you guys have to follow. And once Jesus Christ calls them, appoints them, he gives them instruction, and, and, and that's what Jesus does, guys. If he's called you and he's appointed you, he's going to give an instruction a specific message. Mm -hmm. So if you listen to today and you say, hey, I'm called by God, but I have no idea what I'm doing, do not be called by God. <laughs> if you're in a church that doesn't have a specific message, wow. which is the law, you're not in the right church. Wow. Mm. You're not in the right church. Wow. If you think you're a believer, you don't know what to do, it's because you've not been called. God is crystal clear. When Jesus calls people, he gives them a specific message and he gives them instructions as well. Energy. So if, 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 if that doesn't describe your Christianity, it's not biblical. It's not biblical. Because we gotta understand that Christianity isn't just meant to be personal. Nah. It's not just you come and feel good at church. Nah. Christianity isn't just gospel music. Nope. No. Christianity isn't you just hear a great message and do nothing about it, guys. That's not Christianity. Mm. Jesus Christ has instructions for you to follow. Mm -hmm. And you have to know what they are. Come on, bro. Come on, friend. Come on, friend. Say something here. You gotta shake the dust off your feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, he says that it would be more bearable for that nation, for that city, for that those people on Judgment Day than it would be for Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, you gotta understand, I, I think I, I started touched on this some time ago, a couple of weeks ago. How of course Sodom and Gomorrah were the most wicked, the, the most wicked city in the whole entire Bible. Mm -hmm. And you know, I did a, a faith discussion some time ago titled The Eighth Deadly Sin. Mm -hmm. I like how of course how the Spirit has worked so powerful today, how Elizabeth shared about how Jesus Christ, of course, the liberator, mm -hmm. changed the world. How you know, um, you know, Joseph shared about how uh, we've got all these different sins, you know, uh, pride, greed, lust, and so forth, how we, we turn the good things into bad. Mm -hmm. And of course, the seven deadly sins fall under that. Okay, so it's, it's not in the Bible, of course, this whole seven deadly sin thing, but you know, what are some of the seven deadly sins? You know, gluttony, okay, uh, sloth, all right, pride, greed, lust, envy, wrath, okay, so these are, it says when you fall into your sins, you're in trouble, okay, but the eighth deadly sin, you know, people think, okay, well, what is the eighth deadly sin, Frank? Tell us. Jesus says over here, people who don't accept the message that Christ has given to his messengers, It'll be more bearable for you than all the other seven deadly sins on Judgment Day. Jeez. You're gonna face a harsher judgment. The eighth deadly sin is unbelief. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Unbelief. Wow. 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 Unbelief. Yeah. When you refuse to believe the message that Christ has sent through his messengers. Dang. Come on, bro. And the Bible says we should sit down and try and do apologetics with them. No, it says move on. There's way too many people out there. That's right. Way too many people out there. Yes. Come on. Radical Christianity. Come on, friend. Mm -mm. Radical Christianity. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you gotta make sure, guys, that you're preaching the right message out there. Yeah. Now, what's gonna happen over here if you preach the right message? Let's see what happens. Verse 16. Okay. He says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be in your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. 
The local councils refers to the city halls, the, the uh, politicians, and uh, the synagogues is, um, you know, the religious establishments. So he says, hey, when, when you're preaching a radical message, you're going to have the city council against you. You're going to have the religious people against you as well. Everybody. Everybody. Verse 18, on my account, you've been brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what you say or how to say it. At the time, you begin what you say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Mm. Brother will betray brother to death. Wow. And a father and his child, children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. He says, that's what's going to happen. Uh, Jesus says, the most severe persecution you're going to face is going to be from family. Yeah. Mm. The family going to be the one that's going to the most. They won't want to kill you guys when, when, when you believe in radical Christianity, biblical Christianity. They're going to kill you. It says, you'll be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who's the spirit to the end will be saved. Amen? Amen. When you're persecuted in one place, lead to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes and the church says. Amen. You know the Bible, this says, guys, if everyone loves your church and has great reviews and not getting any persecution whatsoever, mm -hmm. be sure your church is not preaching the right message. Right. Be sure of it. Your church is not preaching the right message. Your Christianity is not radical at all. It's biblical. In the Bible, the church in the Bible was so radical, it, it, it literally turned the world upside down that they were called a cult. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, the word cult in the Bible, it, it, they use the word sect. They call them a sect because they separate themselves from every other religious establishment at that time. Mm -hmm. They said, we are different from everyone else. That's why they call themselves, that's why everyone called them a sect. Right? So they said, okay, you guys are this group of people that is different from everyone else. That's what a sect is. You separate yourself from everyone else. And that's what the Bible, the Christians in the Bible are doing, separating themselves from everyone else. So when we as a church decide to separate ourselves from modern day Christianity, mainstream Christianity, then of course it's a cult too. True story. They'll call you a cult too. But then, in a sense, people don't understand what the word cult really means. <laughs> The word cult, okay, the root word for the word cult, it comes from the Latin cultus. It originated in the 17th century. It means to be fully devoted to a divinity. Wow. It means to worship. Conviction. It means to worship. It means to worship, guys. Yes. So, well, what does that mean? This, this is saying something, guys. Do you know why Christians call us a cult? Because we're Christian. Because we worship. <laughs> <laughs> we're fully devoted yep. to the message. Oh, yep. so, yes. so. <laughs> and, and, and from mainstream Christianity, they're like, oh, 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 wait, I gotta pray and read my Bible every day. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> oh, I stop and watch pornography. Oh, I can't, I can't stay with my boyfriend, we can't live in the same house. Jeez. Oh, I can't do whatever I want to do. Mm. Oh, I have to be fully committed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have to give my money so you guys can plant church in the same nation. Yeah. 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 Mm, nah, you guys are a bit too radical, therefore you are a cult. You are a cult. That's what cult really means. Jeez. Jeez. That's the reason the word cult. So he says, that's how devoted we are. To the message of Christ. Yeah. That's how different we are from everyone else out there. So they call us a cult because we're so different, we're so separate. Mm -hmm. And that's basically how it is, guys. And for those who are listening today, how has your worship been? Mm -hmm. Has your worship to Jesus been so distinct that people, you know, it's called a cult? Mm -hmm. I want you to know if you're studying the Bible right now and, and you, you, you want to join us, you're gonna join a church that's called a cult. Yeah. Straight yeah. up. Come on, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Come on. Amen to that. Sisters, don't worry about the hairs. Yes. Don't worry. You just know how many hairs you have, okay? <laughs> it says, so don't, don't be afraid. You're worth more than many, many sparrows. This is, this is quite powerful, guys. They say, you know, we can be afraid of the wrong things a lot of times as humans. Yeah. Yeah. True. We can fear discipling, 
We can fear being too vulnerable. We can fear trusting again. Right? We can fear a lot of things. And the Bible says, guys, God knows the very numbers of hair on your head. Guys, this is amazing. What, what does this tell us, guys? That God knows you better than your mom or your dad. God knows you better than your best friend. God knows you better than the government. God knows you better than Google. What? Yeah, they have all your data, by the way. Right? Yeah. So, God knows you better than Google. God knows you better than yourself. Yeah. That's what the scripture is teaching. He knows you better than you, anyone else in the world. Yeah. So, that's why you can trust the word of God. Because He knows you, He knows people. We can trust the Bible. And it says over here that we can't be afraid. Mm. So we, we can trust God, guys, in the midst of everything else that's happening. Mm. And when it's said, of course, that fear, of course, isn't a bad thing, guys, okay? Because God created all emotions. Yes. He created everything. Amen. However, on, He created fear to be used to fear Him. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. So mm. that's what fear is used. He created fear so we can fear God. Not things, not people, and so forth, so we can fear God, mm. okay? Mm. So Jesus said, don't be afraid, guys, don't worry. God knows the very number of hairs on your head. Anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a, as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, with my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Wow. Radical Christianity requires radical followers. Yeah. You know, there's no such thing as a secret Christian. Nope. Jesus says that you got to acknowledge him before everyone else. Because if you don't, he's not, he's not going to acknowledge you on Judgment Day. It's pretty simple. Mm. He lays down the ground rules of what it means to truly follow Jesus over here. He says, you got to carry a cross. Now, guess then, this is the first time the word the cross is mentioned in the Bible, in Matthew. And it's not referring to Jesus, it's referring to the followers. The first time the word cross is used. He's like, guys, okay, I know I'm going to go to the cross, but I, I want to apply this to you first. Are you willing to die for me? Are you willing to be that radical to follow Jesus? Are you willing to die for him? Die for the message? Charles Spurgeon said this, an English preacher, he says, if your creed and scripture do not agree, cut your creed to pieces, but make it agree with this book. Mm -hmm. if, if there be anything in the church to which you belong, which is contrary to the inspired word, leave that church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come yeah. on. Wow. Come on. Wow. That's an English preacher. Wow. The challenge is simple, guys. Disciples, stay faithful. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stay faithful. Disciples, preach the word to the lost this week. Amen. Preach the word of God to the lost this week. Yeah. That was the message that Christ had. He said, yeah. this is the message, these are your instructions, preach the lost sheep of Israel. It's always the lostness of the world. That's the message. Preach the word of God this week. Be radical in your, in your Bible talks. Be radical in your discipling times. Mm -hmm. And for those who are watching and listening today, if you feel stirred in your heart, you feel like, man, you, you've not, you, you have no instructions, you have no idea where you go, you have no idea what you're doing, I encourage you, leave that church and join us. Mm. Leave that church and join us. Straight up. Be, be, be radical today. Yep. Radical Christianity, the only way we can, in a sense, normalize radical Christianity is when we are radical. Yes. 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 It's when we are radical. We have to normalize radical Christianity. Come on. Right. Let me tell you something, guys. God has started a radical movement. Amen. Mm -hmm. He took a man named Kim McKean, mm -hmm. Come on. a group of guys in Portland, Oregon. He took those that were radical to LA. In LA in 2007, we started with 42 disciples, and now we have 8,300 disciples Woo. in 111 churches Woo. in 47 nations of six populated continents of the world. Wow. Yeah. I'll tell you the truth, guys, this is not a movement of man, but the very movement of God. 